Good morning, everyone, or rather good midday. Uh, welcome back to the Peterson Institute for International Economics. I'm Adam Posen, the Institute's president. And we are very excited today to present a new policy brief the Institute is publishing by three truly eminent public intellectuals and policymakers, Peter Orzag, Robert Rubin, and Joseph Stiglitz. It's titled, Fiscal Resiliency in a Deeply Uncertain World. And it makes a new and fresh argument about what resiliency means in this time when fiscal rules seem to be ignored for good reason. Um, and what is the responsible way to think about US and other countries' fiscal policies going forward. We're very grateful to the three co-authors for allowing the Peterson Institute to publish this. I will note that it is a PIE policy brief that went through the same internal review processes and fact checking that all of the Institute's publications do. It is freely available on the Institute's website and I hope to be widely distributed, including to the people of the incoming Biden administration as we await the president-elect's announcement of his stimulus package tonight. But this is a freestanding event that talks about what really should be the medium term perspective and the changes in the fiscal regime of the US going forward. This is a new perspective in dialogue with other views that the Peterson Institute has both written and advanced and published. Uh, recently, we had a paper by uh, our fellow Jason Furman and the board vice chair, Larry Summers on their approach to fiscal policy in a world of secular stagnation. Um, this is a long-standing discussion that we're proud of the Peterson Institute to be part of. Uh, a critical stage was reached with the Rethinking Macroeconomic Policy Conference we hosted, led by Olivia Blanchard and Larry Summers back in 2017, in which we started rethinking fundamentally some of the, some of the macroeconomic principles that had not served us well uh, during the global financial crisis and did not seem to conform to the economic realities we now face. This, uh, of course, was followed by the incredibly important work by my colleague Olivier Blanchard, the first and senior fellow at Peterson, in his, summarized in his ASSA, excuse me, his AEA presidential address. And more recently, work he has done with Alvaro Zenomeyer on debt sustainability. There's also a long history of the Peterson Institute, going back to my own work on both Japan's fiscal policies of the 90s and 2000s, and work I and many others in the team have done on the stability and growth pact in Europe. But and critically, I want to come back to this point of debt sustainability, that the even if secular stagnation persists, there are still constraints of debt sustainability. And the question is how to integrate them into present day policy making, how to evaluate them in this environment. And this is where I think there's a real contribution and a very topical one from our presenters today to think about what does interest rate risk mean? What does uncertainty at a fundamental level, which of course Joe Stiglitz has led the way for decades on thinking about economic policy, how does this play out? And of course, Robert Rubin in his service as Treasury Secretary and other ways has thought deeply about the practice of policymaking under uncertainty. So that is where the core of this goes, I believe, and I heartily recommend that everyone read the author's policy brief, but it will be presented shortly by Peter Orzak. I also just want to note that this is part of a public dialogue. Um, there are differing views, and we're proud to present differing views within a reasonable range. Our colleagues at the Peterson Foundation, which is separate but a close cousin, um, have rightly closest energy on issues of intergenerational equity and concerns about that sustainability. We also have joined forces at times with others who have attacked premature austerity policies. We're very proud of the influence we've had in fending some of those off this cycle around as opposed to during the global financial crisis when we struggled somewhat in vain. And so this is a very live debate about what constitutes responsible fiscal policy in today's world. And therefore, again, I'm very grateful to our three co-authors to introduce them in the order in which they will be speaking. We are, Peter Orzag is a member of the B. Pitchson Institute's Board of Directors. He's the Chief Executive Officer of Financial Advisory at Wizard. He previously has been both Director of the Office of Management and Budget of the Obama Administration and of the Independent Congressional Budget Office. He also had a stint at Citigroup as their Vice Chairman of Corporate Investment Banking. 
Peter uh, combines academic financial market and uh, policymaking experience on fiscal policy like Peter. He will be followed by Professor Joseph Stiglitz, who is university professor and founder and president of the Initiative for Policy Dialogue at Columbia University. Joe, of course, was awarded the Nobel Memorial Prize in Economics in 2001, as well as the John Bates Clark Medal in 1979. Joe is the six standard deviations outlined for all of us bright folks in the economics world and has shown over the last 30 years, at least, his intense commitment to issues of inequality, of balancing uh, needs in economic policy, of making economic policy do good in the world. In that role, he also is co-chair of a high-level expert group on the measurement of economic performance and social progress for the OECD has previously been a chief economist at the World Bank and chair of the CBA, the Council of Economic Advisors for President Clinton. And just to make it obvious, the part of the attraction of this is to see people as different as Joe, Bob, and Peter come together about what does fiscal responsibility mean as part of what makes this so exciting. Which leads to our last speaker today, Robert Rubin, the Honorable Robert Rubin, who served as 70th Secretary of the U.S. Treasury from 1995 to 99 and was the first director of the National Economic Council under President Clinton when it was founded. He is chairman emeritus of the Council of Foreign Relations. He is one of the founders of the Hamilton Project and our friends across the street at the Brookings Institution. And he had well, previously had served as co-chair Goldman Sachs and currently is a advisor at Center Bridge Partners. Um, that understates the role that Bob has had in our fiscal debates over the last 30, 40 years in the US and in particular, I remember in our seminal 2017 Rethinking Macroeconomic Policy Conference, he challenged Larry and others who were talking about fiscal policy, worrying about the jumps in interest rates. And so that is a key aspect that is a theme we wish to return to. So thank you all very much for joining us today at the Peters Institute. And please let me turn now to Peter Orzek. Okay, thank you, Adam. Uh, appreciate it. I'm gonna share some slides. So give me a second as I... Uh... I do that. Is that working? I think so. Um, so let me just uh, walk people through uh, the motivation behind this policy brief and then also some of our key conclusions. I think just to start, and perhaps this is the core point, um, our view is that the era of low interest rates is teaching many people the wrong lesson. It's not that rates will necessarily be low forever, which is the way that a lot of the discussions are being conducted with people having to kind of raise their hand and say, well, shouldn't we at least have a caveat that maybe rates um, won't stay this low forever? Um, instead, we think the lesson from the era of low rates is that we did a very bad job anticipating this era, and we should take that thought and embed it in our fiscal paradigm or fiscal architecture so that we have a structure that reflects the deep uncertainty of the world um, and not just update for a change in the parameters like uh, a lower interest rate. So um, that I think if you're gonna take away one overarching message from our perspective, it's that the lesson from the last five or 10 years is more that we're very bad at predicting the future and less that we should project forward an era of low interest rates, uh, you know, without end. Um, so that sounds fine and almost unobjectionable, but the question is, well, okay, so what does that mean specifically in terms of what we should do? Um, there's some things that we think you should not do. So the, the first uh, and most important thing uh, to not do is to rely on the fiscal anchors of the past, uh, like, um, the 3% of deficit, 3% of GDP deficit target uh, that was embodied in the Maastricht Treaty or 60% of, uh, of the economy in debt, um, or even the new uh, metrics of a real net interest as a share of the economy um, threshold. And we'll come back to why these top-down fiscal anchors don't work. Instead, we embrace discretion for policymakers to adjust fiscal policy as needed without being constrained by those arbitrary top-down anchors, but instead exercising their judgment and discretion about how to conduct policy. But, and this is an important but, with 
the additional point that we would have the budget respond more automatically to short-term uh, economic fluctuations and also to the long-term drivers within each program. So the result is what we uh, somewhat inartfully call semi-autonomous discretion. We will uh, admit that marketing may not be our forte and that we're open to better names. So if anyone has a suggestion, please let us know. Uh, the underlying idea though is akin to uh, assisted driving on a highway where the driver still has full autonomy to change direction or speed, but the car is helping to um, take part of the decision-making and simplify it for the driver. And that's really what, uh, the, what we're aiming for here for policymakers, that um, there are automatic adjustments happening under the surface, but on the top of that, policymakers have the ability in a focused way to make uh, adjustments to fiscal policy. So we're putting forward in, in um, particular a five-point um, sketch or a five-point plan that has uh, uh, backs up that general thesis that I, I started with. And I'll go through all of this in a little bit more detail, but that involves more automatic stabilizers, a new infrastructure program, extending debt maturities, um, some indexation of our long-term programs like social security, for example, to their underlying drivers, like life expectancy as an example. And then of course, as I, I mentioned before, uh, reserving discretion on top of all of that for policymakers to adjust as necessary. So I don't think we need to belabor the point that the world's a deeply uncertain place. We're after all living in the middle of a pandemic that was largely un unanticipated. And in the middle of that pandemic, we've seen household savings increase, credit card debt decline and credit scores uh, improve, uh, all of which would seem you know, very hard to predict ahead of time two or three years ago. This document just shows uh, one manifestation of the phenomenon where uh, these are from August, 2019, projections from the Congressional Budget Office for real GDP. The projected growth rate for real GDP um, was expected to vary between 0.7% and 3.3%, which is a pretty wide um, variance with two thirds, with uh, a, th that's the two thirds confidence interval. So there's, um, a third chance that you'd be outside of that band. And I would just note that if you look at the 2020 number, we are very, very likely to be under $19 trillion in real GDP for, 20, for calendar year 2020. And so this will be an example that we will be outside of that uh, era band um, that was again defined in August of 2019. The other defining characteristic of uh, recent history is just this ongoing decline in um, both nominal and real interest rates, which uh, Adam mentioned and which is a core part of the fiscal debate. Here we just show what they are. But one thing that we did uh, want to highlight is that we shouldn't be so confident about projecting out that lower rate of interest as far as the eye can see. And the reason for that is that there are many different influences driving the, that reduction in interest rates. We don't fully understand all of the different moving pieces. And because we don't, we believe that there may well be changes in the future. So um, some examples, and uh, there are lots of different ways of slicing this, but we found it convenient to rely on a recent Congressional Budget Office analysis of the causes of lower rates. Um, one thing that has uh, driven rates down over the past couple decades is lower productivity and output growth. Um, economists are, are, are known to be not very good at projecting forward um, things like productivity growth. So that could um, very well be different in the future than it has been in the past. Even things that we do understand fairly well, uh, like demographics, can have uh, different, can have complex effects on the interest rate. So it's well known that as uh, people enter the workforce disproportionately and go through their careers, savings rates tend to build through that life cycle. And then when um, more of the population retires and you shift towards that phase of the life cycle, savings rates tend to decline. Um, it has been noted in another Peterson Institute uh, event that we are rapidly migrating towards the second part of that uh, phenomenon. 
but the effects can be quite complicated. So um, for example, by itself, um, there was one estimate that the move towards greater retirement will raise re interest rates by about 50 basis points. There's a counter argument that with longer life expectancy, the effect may be offset. So even within the demographic uh, effect itself, there is ambiguity about the pathway forward. And that is the central thing that we wanna emphasize rather than the prediction about uh, exactly where the rate is, that there is a lot of uncertainty about the future course of interest rates. Uh, the impact of that can be quite significant. So here we just show um, one illustration. I'd immediately note that for those that are following uh, this debate quite carefully, this chart shows nominal net interest, not real net interest as a share of GDP. And so the numbers are a bit different from the metric that um, Jason Furman and Larry Summers have put forward. But the point about the variance around that metric, that carries across here. So um, what we're showing you here is if interest rates increase by 25 basis points a year, by 2025, uh, net interest as a share of the economy would be 0.7% higher than whatever number you thought you were going to hit. And if that 25 basis point increase were on, a, uh, on an inflation adjusted basis, the same thing would hold with regard to real net interest as a share of the economy. And so it's very easy to get swings that are quite material relative to a target, for example, of say 2% of GDP for real net interest as a share of the economy from relatively modest changes uh, in interest rates. And that's what brings us to one of the core points, which is a um, skepticism about top-down fiscal anchors. Um, and I think there are two problems with these anchors, which take various forms, but think of them as a deficit to GDP or a debt to GDP um, target. The first problem is no one knows exactly where the, the critical threshold is. So uh, is it unsustainable or problematic to go beyond 60% of GDP or 80% of GDP in debt or 100% of GDP in debt? The reason that no one knows where that threshold is, it, is that it depends on investor perceptions. It depends on the state of financial markets. It depends on alternative investments and a whole variety of other variables that are beyond the purview of fiscal models and which typically change over time. And therefore you can't define just one threshold. And the second is, um, well, that's the, that's the first problem. The second problem is even if we knew where the threshold was, let's say we know that you can't go above 110% of GDP in debt, just as an example. Um, we have very little insight into when we would hit that. So if even if you knew where the threshold is, there's so much uncertainty about the deficit and debt projections, we give you some of the confidence intervals below, that it's hard to know what to do today, even if you knew uh, what the critical threshold of some uh, fiscal anchor was. And so the result of those two things is that we're really skeptical about the use of fiscal anchors that are top down in this uh, way. This is very similar to a concern that um, Olivia Blanchard and uh, co-authors have highlighted in some working papers and in a forthcoming Peterson Institute paper about the problems with top down fiscal anchors. And as just one example, the famous 3% of deficit uh, target that was embodied in the Maastricht uh, Treaty um, was effectively just invented or made up out of thin air. And that is indeed the whole point, which is you tend to just pick relatively arbitrary targets, which was the first point because you don't really know where the critical threshold is. Really important to note, we are not saying that uh, uh, that a uh, some critical threshold doesn't exist. We're just saying we don't know where it would be. And we also therefore don't know when we would hit it. So that's some background. And then let me just briefly go through uh, the five points that are uh, our well-named semi-autonomous discretion uh, approach to fiscal policy. Uh, the first is to bolster the auto stabilizers. So these are things that um, go up or down with the state of the economy automatically. Um, there are a whole variety of different options here, including uh, direct cash rebates, uh, unemployment insurance, state and local fiscal aid, um, what used to be called um, food stamps, now called SNAP, um, that would expand or contract based on the state of the economy automatically. We think we should strengthen that so that the budget responds 
more automatically to the state of the economy. I would note that uh, we are going to have this debate in real time over the next few weeks or months, because I think one of the questions facing the Biden team and the Congress as they consider another round of fiscal support is whether they will embody more of these features into um, what is enacted or discussed. It's always easy to say, uh, there's a fire right now, we can't deal with it. So we're not gonna build in a, kind of a structural fix that makes the problem better um, for in the, future, in the next crisis. Um, I really hope that we take uh, this opportunity to avoid doing that same kind of response and instead build in stronger auto stabilizers into whatever is done over the next couple months to shore up the economy in the short run. Um, part two, one of the things that has happened over the past couple of decades is that infrastructure spending, which we um, often talk about in terms of short-term economic support for the economy, has become pro-cyclical. Um, what that, in, in other words, it goes up when the economy is weak, and more importantly, it goes down when the economy. I mean, sorry, it goes up when the economy is strong. It goes down when the economy is weak, and that is a pattern that we would like to reverse. So we propose a new program that would more automatically expand during recessions uh, and focus on projects that could be completed or substantially accelerated during the period of economic weakness when the macro benefit of doing the infrastructure investment is higher, the opportunity cost of deploying resources for that infrastructure investment is lower, uh, and we could go through later if people are interested some of the mechanics of how to do that. The third part involves lengthening debt maturities in order to um, provide more insurance against the risk of, a, uh, of an increase in interest rates. Um, and there's a variety of ways that we could do that. Um, we could just tilt the issuance of uh, new treasuries to longer dated instruments like the 10 or 20 or 30 year or we could create even longer dated uh, instruments like a 50 or 100 year bond or even a perpetual bond uh, and issue uh, more uh, debt there. A couple things are worth noting about this. First, the extension of maturities uh, mitigates the risk of an interest rate increase for the federal government. It does not eliminate it. Um, it would take the existing stock of debt over time and insulate that, but um, future deficits would still need to be financed and um, if interest rates go up, that would mean that they would be financed at uh, those higher rates. And secondly, like any insurance policy, maturity extension is not a free lunch. Um, you typically pay a higher yield on bonds that are longer dated in maturity. There's always the risk or the chance that interest rates will go down instead of up. And so while you had insured yourself against the uncertainty, ex post, it will look like uh, it was a mistake from that perspective. Uh, and then finally, we would note that uh, this part of the program needs to be coordinated with, or at least take account of what the Fed has been doing, which has the net effect of moving maturities in the opposite direction. The fourth part of our program uh, involves taking some of our long-term programs and trying to index them to underlying, their underlying drivers. So we go into more detail in the paper about uh, Medicare and Medicaid. Here, I'll just touch upon Social Security. Clearly, one of the drivers of our pension program is life expectancy. And there is subtleties around what's been happening to life expectancy because in addition to at least over the past couple decades, if not the past couple years, average life expectancy has been going up, but there's also been a significant change in the gradient of life expectancy by lifetime income with higher earners increasingly living longer than typical people and lower income uh, workers. And that complexity would need to be taken into account. But generically, what we're trying to do here is two things. One is arguably the point of social security, which provides a benefit as long as you're alive, is to provide protection for the individual against outliving uh, their savings or their assets compared to what they might have thought was a typical life expectancy for their um, cohort or their uh, age group. Uh, that is a different problem than uh, as life expectancy for the population as a whole uh, migrates over time. 
We believe the intent of Social Security should be to provide that protection at the individual level, but economy-wide or population-wide uh, changes in life expectancy uh, need to be addressed in a different way. And we think that the program should therefore be automatically offset in some way, perhaps only on the revenue side, uh, to handle or accommodate the changes in life expectancy that happen over time. Assuming life expectancy goes up on average in the future, um, that would tilt towards fiscal balance. Um, and we believe that's actually a feature, not a bug, because there's an asymmetry in the difficulty of undoing uh, the, in this example, for example, the tax increase that would come from higher life expectancy if the adjustment were all done on the revenue side, relative to undoing a tax cut if life expectancy went in the other direction. And so that asymmetry is the uh, original intent behind the, the protected budget reconciliation rules, noticing that it was more difficult to do deficit reduction than fiscal expansion. And so we think it is a benefit to have these automatic adjustments operating under the hood, but tilting towards fiscal balance as uh, the, we get to the final piece, which is just a more resilient budget that includes all of these adjustment factors, but preserves discretion for policymakers on top of it all. And that's the semi-autonomous discretion uh, we talked about before. Uh, two things before I turn it over to Joe. One is that um, we note in the paper, and I think uh, Bob in particular will touch upon this uh, in a bit, that there's a lot here that we agreed upon. There are things we don't agree upon, including how policymakers should act uh, in late 2022 or thereafter whenever we hit full employment. Uh, and there are other subtleties uh, of disagreement, but there's a lot here that we do agree on. And so I just wanted to end on a personal note, which is um, Bob and Joe have been seen as representing different parts of the policymaker spectrum. So much so that in an article that was uh, focused a little bit more on me, they were presented as putting me in an uh, impossible position because I was caught between their two orbits. And I am really um, just thrilled that we were able to unify uh, those two perspectives, at least for this uh, purpose. And I think that's uh, an important note in today's world. So with that, I will stop sharing and turn it over to Joe. Thank you so much, Peter. And thank you for that personal note. Obviously, we hope people come for the odd couple aspect of this, tri this troika and go away with the substantive result of it, which is very exciting. Joe, whenever you're ready, Please take us through your thoughts. Uh, well, thank you very much. And thank, uh, I thank Peterson Institute for giving us this opportunity to uh, present our, uh, our, our paper. Um, both, all three of us uh, have in one way or another, uh, big concern all our life with uncertainty, risk, uh, Bob in a more practical way, my, uh, me in a more, uh, abstract theoretical way. And uh, in a way, this uh, moment of extreme uncertainty that the pandemic reflects uh, is a moment where we uh, naturally uh, ought to be thinking about what implications does uh, this kind of extreme uncertainty have for the conduct of uh, economic policy. And so, uh, there is, there, there's a lot of, uh, you might call it deep uh, research, mathematical work going on into the analysis of, of policy, uh, of, of macroeconomics, policy making under, in the presence of uh, deep uncertainty. Uh, and this is more of a, uh, you might say a, a policy paper that is partially uh, trying to represent some of the ideas that will eventually emerge from that. So what I wanted to do in my few minutes here is talk a little bit about some of the links with the economic, uh, economics literature so that uh, those among the audience who, who've been uh, indoctrinated into economic models uh, will see where at least some of the connections between uh, what we are doing and what is, are some of the dominant issues in, uh, uh, in the literature. Uh, let me first begin by saying uh, 
you know, in terms of the title of the paper, uh, I think the paper is about more than fiscal resiliency. It's about macroeconomic stability. It's about programmatic uh, resiliency. Like uh, uh, Peter tried to describe the, some of the objectives of social uh, security, social insurance. And as we adopt a program like that, we ought to have a conception of what we want that program to do over the long run and uh, how we can uh, make it more resilient to some of the uh, uh, macroeconomic shocks that the economy is going to face. So underlying point of, uh, the, the underlying point of departure is a perspective on risk and uncertainty that is I, I think markedly different from that prevailing in much of the recent macroeconomics. Uh, in that literature, uh, macroeconomics is about adjustment uh, in a world with rational expectations to a set of shocks, which are mostly defined as technology shocks. Uh, and the key point is there's uh, a well-defined probability distribution. Everybody can figure it out. These are repeated shocks. And uh, um, there's actually, uh, to use a technical term, there's common knowledge about what the probability distribution is. When we think about the kinds of shocks that our economy and our society has faced, they don't fit into that model. You know, the big things that have happened, uh, the 2008 financial crisis uh, was not a technology shock. Uh, it was uh, something that was outside most of those models. COVID-19, you know, a few people uh, did anticipate that there was a chance of that, but it was clearly not built into the macroeconomic models. Nor was even the politics of the, the new era of protectionism that we're confronting today, today. So more broadly, almost all the big shocks uh, that, the macroeconomy faces are outside the kind of rational expectations, uh, models with uh, well-defined probability distributions. So um, the implication is, you know, the, uh, formally you can think of these as non-stationary stochastic processes. Uh, the implication of that is uh, precisely what Peter said, top-down uh, anchors don't work. Uh, they're not just arbitrary, they're likely to be broken, and knowledge that that is the case reduces even their value as a commitment device. And even when they're not broken, they often don't serve the economy well. They induce unnecessary contraction, as we saw in the Euro crisis in 2010. Uh, one way of thinking about this is standard anchor anchors are like incomplete contracts and uh, uh, there come times when you need to break an incomplete contract or uh, to refine it. Uh, one of the things we know, while these top-down anchors don't work in this uh, environment of extreme uncertainty, we also know that the design of policy frameworks matters. Uh, we know a lot about the absence of a complete set of uh, aerodrome markets, incomplete contracts, and perfect and asymmetric information means the market often does not handle risks well. We know that markets can amplify risk, can ma amplify macroeconomic variability at great cost to individuals the, uh, and to the macroeconomy. We also know that the design of the system can affect the exposure to risks, and this is what we're particularly concerned, the designing of the system, including the policy framework, can help us manage those risks. And then the final point, uh, there's a broad consensus, I think, that abrupt discrete changes are typically far more costly than more gradual adjustments. And uh, the problem, you know, one of the arguments against fixed exchange rates were, they were fixed until they weren't fixed. And, and at those moments when there were adjustments, there were extreme uh, stresses on the economy. 
uh, a typically uh, often a very deep economic uh, downturns. So the point I want to make is that while we are in a world of, of, of deep uncertainty, we know something and we know some things with some degree of confidence. And let me just give you an example. That doesn't mean we have to be, um, shall I say, skeptical. We have to keep rethinking what we know, reassessing what we know. Uh, but here are um, uh, two things I think we, we feel, the first, uh, uh, with a great deal of confidence, uh, and the second, with even more confidence. The first is, uh, in almost all economic downturns, we would have been better served with better automatic stabilizers and weaker automatic destabilizers. We have a lot of these destabilizers, the way uh, the balanced budget frameworks that states run under is an automatic destabilizer that has been problematic, it was uh, uh, one of the reasons for the depth of the Great Depression and limited the ability of the New Deal to, to respond to the, to the Great uh, Depression. And we saw it in the recession of 2008, nine, even by 2019, we had not gotten back to the public sector employment at the state and local level that we had uh, in 2007. Um, so the fact that these amplify economic uh, variability means that we should be willing to pay something, an insurance premium for greater stability. And uh, beyond that, when we think about some of the particular automatic stabilizers like unemployment insurance, there are actually good arguments for why programs like UI should depend on the state of the economy. So uh, here, you know, the, the natural automatic stabilizer is, UI is always an automatic stabilizer, but we, in 2008, we extended the unemployment insurance for a longer period of time until the unemployment rate came down. And we should make that a permanent feature of the program. Another thing that we know some confidence uh, is what used to be described as the basic law of economics. Uh, economics is the law of scarcity. So we know once we reach full employment, and we're not sure where that is, we have to face constraints of resource scarcity. Um, and I just emphasize here, and this is, there is some, some uncertainty about when these constraints are, uh, set in and uh, about the potential for using existing resources better to move the constraint uh, out and the consequences of, of uh, uh, not catching things in time. So uh, this is the moment, I think, for a re-emphasis on fiscal policy and the reason for the paper. We've seen limits on monetary policy and with the projected low interest rates uh, projected to extend for a long period of time, monetary policy is not likely to play a major role in stabilization. And I, let me emphasize the limits of monetary policy go beyond the zero lower bound. There's difficulties, for instance, in inducing banks to lend uh, in the midst of a downturn. And uh, something that we often for, forget in our aggregate models, but is very clear when you use a disaggregate model, that monetary policy is distortionary. It puts the burden of adjustment on interest sense and uh, sectors. Moreover, the counter to that is the experience over the past decade has shown that fiscal policy can be very timely, very effective. Ricardian equivalence, which says that it doesn't work, that's been totally discredited in uh, uh, the data that's come out in the response to the 2008-9 crisis. Uh, fiscal multipliers can be uh, very, very large. And so the um, final point is, again, to reiterate what uh, Peter said, deep uncertainty means that you can't put the economy on an autopilot. Discretion is going to be necessary. Behavioral economics tells us that we frequently look for heuristics to help us uh, in decision making. And this is all the more so in the context of social, uh, social decision making. Uh, in a world with deep un uh, uncertainty, we can't 
simply extrapolate from the past. But neither do we want to renegotiate, as, uh, as it were, uh, ab initio, every time we confront a social decision. And I think uh, one way of thinking of what we've tried to do uh, here is to provide a framework that takes what we know with some degree of confidence, uh, recognizes the things that we don't know, and uh, making judgments about that allows for efficiency and economy in decision making. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joe, for linking this back to the broader underlying picture, um, economically and academically. And as usual, you managed to convey a huge amount of intuition. Um, so thank you for doing that. Let me now turn to, there's nothing else to say, that was great. Um, let me now turn to Bob, uh, who is maybe not an academic, but is certainly thoughtful, experienced, and cares deeply about these issues. Thank you for joining us, Bob, to give us your perspective. Adam, thank you for having us. Uh, let me start by acknowledging what others have already said, which is that Joe and I have had different views on a, a number of issues over the years, and we've worked together for a long time, actually, in one way or another. But here, under Peter's leadership, we found agreement on many fundamental issues, which they've described at length and which I will not get into. And then we've also found the areas that uh, remain to be debated. And we've identified those as a guidance to where policymakers, if they take our framework, should, fo should focus the debate going forward. And I think it is this spirit of coming together and finding common ground in which elected officials ought to approach all of the policy divides, the political divides that we have, both the divides within parties and then the divides across party lines. And I'm not naive about politics. I, I've been involved in this stuff for a long time, but I have seen it work. It certainly worked in the 1997 balance of budget agreement where President Clinton and the majority leader Trent Lott got together and they agreed on a program that reduced deficits and increased public investment and led to balanced budgets for the first time in 30 years. And it seems to me it is that spirit in which we have to move forward in this country if we're going to be successful legislatively in doing what needs to be done for our economy to reach, to realize the potential it has. And if we don't, I think we're in a lot of trouble. With respect to the program that we put out today, uh, I've been involved in markets for a long, long time. And I think there is one certainty about markets. And that one certainty is exactly what Joe and Peter said, which is uncertainty. And I think what we've done here is to provide a framework for dealing with that uncertainty and to come up with sound policy decisions, both for the shorter term and the longer term. We also, as I mentioned a moment ago, identified areas of further debate. And in that context, let me express my views as to what I think we should do when we get back to a full employment economy, however that may be defined and whatever that may be. I totally agree that in, in the, at the, this moment, <laughs> with all of the problems that we face, we should have very large stimulus in all the ways that Joe and, and, and Peter have described. And there should be no tax increases or spending cuts until we get back to full employment again, recognizing the uncertainty about how to define an unemployment and when that might happen. Having said that, I think we then need to focus, or even actually, I think simultaneously should think about what our fiscal policy ought to be for the intermediate and longer term. And I think there are multiple risks with respect to our current trajectory in, for the intermediate and longer term. And those include undermining business confidence because of uncertainty about future policy, which is what happened in the early 90s, uh, diminished resilience to deal with emergencies, although that's certainly not the case right now. However, as you see our debt to GDP ratio ratcheting up, it's not hard to imagine that that could happen at some point. Reduced fiscal capacity and, and a reduced political appetite for public investment, and that has happened, I think, over quite some period of time now. And also the possibility that if we run into fiscal trouble, there'd be significant pressure to reduce public investment very substantially. One that's most often focused on in this conversation is increased treasury and, and private sector borrowing rates because of uncertainty about inflation or uncertainty about future imbalances or possibly a weaker dollar and capital outflows. And then inflation itself could be fed by excess demand if you have unsound fiscal policy could be fed by uh, significant 
contraction in our or significant decline in our, in our currency or various other factors. And finally, there was always the possibility of severe market distress. And with severe market distress would come serious declines in business confidence, consumer confidence, and the very real possibility of, of major economic duress and possibly even crisis. These risks have not materialized for a long time, except as I mentioned before, with respect to public investment. But in my opinion, at least, all of history suggests, all of financial history suggests, that markets that get out of sync with reality almost always, sooner or later, adjust very often rapidly and savagely. In that vein, the renowned investor and, and, and investment author, Howard Marks, wrote in 2019 that the most, four most dangerous words for investors are, quote, this time it's different, unquote. And his current examples included two. One, quote, unquote, well, one quote, <laughs> national debt isn't worrisome, unquote. And two, federal deficits can contribute, can grow substantially larger without becoming problematic, unquote. It's always possible this time is different, but at least in my view, all of economic history suggests that that is highly unlikely. And maybe even more fundamentally, that's not a risk we have to take. Prior to the pandemic, the federal revenues as a percent of GDP were substantially below the average for full employment economies and way below where they were at the end of the Clinton administration, we had excellent economic conditions. So I believe that once we get back to full employment, there is ample room to increase taxes on a highly progressive basis and both fund public investment and gradually reduce our fiscal trajectory. And secondly, our healthcare costs, as we all know, are high, very high actually, relative to GDP compared to other developed countries with no better outcomes. And that suggests that there is ample opportunity to reform our healthcare system, bring down the healthcare costs in our country, which of course could also benefit the federal healthcare programs. Let me mention one technical point. Uh, R minus G, that is to say, uh, real interest rates minus lower real growth, or rather minus real growth, are in a favorable position right now. And economists will say that that's a good position because that means that all other things be equal, debt to GDP ratio come down. The two problems with that, it seems to me, are one, that can change very quickly and unexpectedly. And number two, if you have large legislative deficits on top of the existing stock of debt, then that will Ad adversely if, or increase debt GDP ratio over time. The second thing that very troubles me, very deeply troubles me, is that when we get into difficulty economically, we go into substantial deficit funded expenditure, which is exactly what we should do. But the trouble is when conditions improve, we don't repair our fiscal position. And the result it seems to me is that we are on a path of ratcheting up from what is already, already the highest level of debt as a percentage of our economy in our peacetime history, except in the period immediately after World War II, when we were coming down from the World War II levels. So let me wind up by saying that I think all of this is difficult. All of this is very serious. All of this, I think, can profoundly affect our future economic conditions. And I think what the three of us have tried to do here, at least, is to provide a framework for thinking thoughtfully about this and dealing with the complexities and the uncertainties that Joe and Peter have mentioned. And finally, as I said before, so I'll just say it once again, I think the fact that three of us were able to get together and come up with this and come up with so much common ground suggests that if people are willing to engage in, in the give and take of principle compromise and willing to look at facts and analysis of the decision making, that we can overcome the policy and political divides in our system. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. And obviously at this time in, in American public, life, it's wonderful to have people coming together. That's not to say that as much differences as you and Joe uh, had, citing Peter's quote, is the kind of differences we're, we're quite so worried about right now, but it is a very healthy start and example. Um, we've had a number of questions come in over the Zoom chat and over the email, and I've tried to gather some of them. I'm going to direct them to individual authors. Um, as, get through as many as we can with our distinguished guests. So first off to Joe, um, you, you talk about these, the opposition to top-down rules and the semi-autonomous discretion as, a, as kind of an insurance payment. A, a, I'm being sloppy, forgive me, but, but you know, but coping with very much uncertainty. Um, we, we see this paper as in some ways focusing on interest rate uncertainty, 
But of course, as you mentioned, there's also a great deal of uncertainty about the path of potential output, about full employment. I mean, for, to try to make maybe not a simple rule, but a guideline of for, for policymakers, do we need to worry about each set of uncertainties separately, or do we focus on interest rates as some kind as as sort of the way to think about where the uncertainty shows up, or do we need to do something specifically with the automatic stabilizers with potential output? Just if you could flesh out a little more about how the different sources of uncertainty affect this. Well, first, I mean the point uh, you made is uh, it's just it's not just interest rate uncertainties. All the parameters that go into the economy, uh, like uh, technical change, uh, productivity, a lot of variability in productivity, and that's a huge driver of, uh, uh, of the uh, 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 long-run fiscal position of, of the economy. So, so every fund, fundamental parameter, savings rate is another one, uh, and, you know, all the key drivers are uncertain. Um, we, they're interrelated, and they're interrelated in complex ways that we don't fully understand. And we have to understand that. That is to say, this is really a paper, we say, uh, a, a plea for humility and a plea that you don't take a complex system like that and believe you can steer it with numbers like 2% inflation, 3% deficit, 60% debt GDP ratio. What you need is more complex uh, analysis. So um, it doesn't mean that you don't look at those numbers. You know, the, it doesn't mean you, you look at the debt GDP ratio. Uh, it, it's clearly a relevant variable, but uh, it's a plea more I, maybe it's a, a full employment act for economists, but it's a plea that you do as good a, uh, of a debt sustainability analysis as you can if you're focusing on uh, debt. But as I said in, in, in my beginning, uh, beginning remarks, it's not just about debt sustainability, it's about programmatic sustainability. If you really think we wanna have a, a program for retiree social security, we have to think about what is a sustainable retirement program for our elderly. So uh, that's where, our, you know, I think it's really important to think about this as macroeconomic sustainability, budget sustainability, and every one of our programmatic sustainability and design a framework where we can then use all of our cognitive ability to focus on the things that are not working well and adjusting at the margin. Thank you very much, Joe. And I will just put in a plug, as you mentioned in the paper that is on the PIE website by these authors. Uh, we There is a related paper, complimentary by uh, Blanchard, Leandro, and Zettelmeyer on the idea of using Europe, of looking at fiscal standards as opposed to rules. It's, it's a similar kind of spirit and humility, although obviously the details are different. Uh, we do, uh, by the way, have a lot of questions about comparisons between U.S. and EU. Those are incredibly important issues, and I think that goes under the heading of Joe's uh, Full Employment Act for Economists, that we're going to have to return to those, maybe with some of these authors and other folks at a, at a later date. Um, let me now turn to Bob. Um, Bob, the discussion about debt management at the Treasury, as well as interactions with the Fed, is, is a recurrent issue. Um, there have been very strong opinions expressed over time about the benefits and costs of issuing greater duration, less duration. You've come down pretty clearly with your co-authors today for greater duration right now. Um, I was wondering if you could just expand a bit on your views on that. In particular, two points. One, there isn't uh, an insatiable desire for long-term debt. I mean, the very long-term debt Ten, or maybe I'm wrong, you can correct me, but there, it seems like that there's a, a, a limited universe of buyers of the very long-term debt. Maybe we're nowhere close to saving that though. But secondly, a, a theme I hear repeatedly is, doesn't that just shift the burden further down the intergenerational road that it's maybe our grandkids instead of our kids who have to pay it back? What good does that do? So if you could just say in practical terms, 
why you feel so strongly on the long duration debt right now. Yeah, on the first point, Adam, if you're talking about the, if you're talking about 30 year treasuries, in the world of uncertainty that we exist in today, and I kind of think this uncertainty is going to continue in varying ways for a long time. I suspect there will always, I should always be, but I think for the first, for as long as any of us are going to look out into the future right now, I think there will always be massive demand for, for 30 year treasuries, unless something changes dramatically. And if it changes dramatically and rates go way the heck up, then we will have obviously been well served by having extending our maturities before that. If you're talking about 50 year bonds and 100 year bonds and per 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 perpetual bonds, that's a, that's, a, that's a new world. That's terra incognita, Adam. And I, I, don't, I don't have any idea what, what the appetite might be. And I think, at least I'll speak for myself, my focus is more on the 30 year bonds. As far as shifting the obligation outstanding, the obligations that are, that are going to affect our future generations and the, and the issues that they face are the issues of our fiscal trajectory. And whether you fund them short term or long term, you're going to be funding them. And I, I think that, if, at least if you have our view, that there's an asymmetry here and it's more likely rates will go up than go down. And secondly, as I think Joe has emphasized, you want to avoid shocks if you can avoid them, then it seems to me longer term maturities make sense. Thank you, Bob. Uh, turning to Peter, um, one thing that didn't seem to come up in your presentation are issues of climate change and funding. You've talked about long-term infrastructure spending, but not specifically about environmental issues. If the Biden administration, as I think we all hope, was going to undertake a large-scale investment in decarbonization in the U.S., or successive U.S. administrations were, how does that fit in your framework, or is that a separate thing that you should think about differently? No, I don't think it's a separate thing. I think a, a lot of the infrastructure investment in particular that should be happening over the next couple of years involves the energy transition. And we are at a highly unusual moment that um, we've seen the cost, if you talk about power generation, for example, the cost of uh, wind and solar in particular, so onshore wind and industrial scale solar just plummet over the past 10 to 15 years. And that is combined with a moment when a lot of traditional um, fossil fuel powered generating plants are nearing the end of their useful life and need to be replaced anyway. That combination is very, very powerful. So, you know, a lot of that can be privately financed and is not a, a government uh, question, but there are a whole bunch of other government uh, questions that will implicate government investment or government assisted investment. Uh, so we didn't go into detail about the type of infrastructure that would uh, be part of our second component, but you could imagine a lot of that being energy related. Can I just add one more thing, Adam, which is that the uncertainties about climate change are another example that we're of the deep uncertainties that we live in. And that uh, you get the stochastic processes describing uh, the environment are clearly not stationary and uh, is another reason for uh, committing oneself to a kind of uh, framework, architecture of the kind that we proposed. Thank you very much. I just want to be clear for everyone, although I think no one will make this mistake. When Joe says uncertainties about climate change, he doesn't mean doubt that climate change is occurring. <laughs> he means the range of possible of bad outcomes it will promote. Just, just to be sure. Um, although I think anyone watching Joe knows that's the case. Um, Joe, let me, let me ask you a different follow-up question, a very high concept question from, from Martin Schiff. Um, in a sense, one could argue that we're kind of lucky that we had secular stagnation and, and the financial crisis because rates, real rates as well as nominal, were so low this time around, allowing the massive fiscal response we've had, obviously limiting monetary policy. But. I mean, is, is that is that a right way to look at this, or is the kind of framework you're talking about something that would allow us to respond, God forbid, if there's another pandemic on this kind of scale, if 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 rates go up in future? How do you think about that? Well, I mean, say, I think our framework is the right way to think about it, whether we were at uh, a very different uh, moment of time where we had a very different kind of uh, of shock. Uh, that we were facing, say, the kind of inflationary shocks that we faced in the 70s. I think uh, the, the point is the oil shock is another example where something happened that we had not anticipated. So the uh, 
commitment to rules, top-down anchors, is always a bad idea. And I think we've provided here a framework that's a big, uh, for decision-making under uh, both uh, cases of where the, where the shocks are of the kind that we've just experienced, where we're having excess capacity, or other kinds of shocks like the oil price shocks, where inflation is the, is the more, uh, issue of the day. So uh, the, the key role here is the, the magnitude of, uh, that we don't know uh, about uh, the economy, but trying to bring in what we, what we do know. The one more point I would make is uh, the fact that we have all this excess capacity now and are likely to have that, and even more so with robotization, artificial intelligence, worries about increasing unemployment. We have an abundance of both labor and capital. And that means we are in a unique position from the macroeconomic point of view to have the green transition that is really going to be necessary. So uh, from that point of view, we shouldn't let ourselves be tethered by some artificial top-down anchors that were designed for a very different uh, world. You're on mute. Yeah, terrific. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Bob. So we are reaching the end of our time. Um, there are many questions we haven't gotten to, and I apologize for that. But let me turn to, to Bob and Peter on this sort of picking up on Bob's last point in the presentation. You both are veterans of the fiscal debates in the U.S. for a long time, have been in the responsible fiscal positions, have dealt with Congress. Given the divisions we have in Congress, given some preconceived notions Congress has, beyond the simple merits, how do you go about politically selling the program you got? What, what are your steps now? Obviously, if you can sit down with the president-elect, which some of you might actually be able, the three of you might actually be able to do, that's one thing. But beyond that, what, what's the framing or the packaging or the arguments you think that work with Congress if you want to pursue this program in the near term? First, Bob, then Peter, and we'll end it there. I think I'll defer mostly to Peter, but let me make an observation, Adam. Judgments in the, discretion, in, in the discretionary arena, as, as we have described, would be part of our program, are highly imperfect. But it seems to me highly imperfect judgments are certainly a lot better than arbitrary anchors. And that, it seems to me, is, is sort of underlies our, our entire foundation. I think what I would say to people is that we've got very complex issues. There's tremendous uncertainties. And what we need to do is what the late Marty Feldstein said. He said to me once, he said, I'm a, I'm a conservative, but I'm willing to compromise. And if I can find a liberal who's equally willing to compromise, we can find answers to these problems. And I think if you go to, if, if, they go, if people go at it in that spirit, what we provided is a framework where we've limited the amount of discretion, you, we've limited the areas in which you need to apply your discretion. And then we've said, yes, we recognize discretion is imperfect, but it's certainly a lot better than arbitrary anchors. Thank you, Bob. Peter? I would just say, look, there's the sort of modality, which I think for the next few months is likely to collapse into the budget reconciliation process, which is a technical process for how things are, uh, how things could be enacted with 50 votes instead of 60 in the Senate. And then there's this sort of broader uh, political debate, those are likely to be different things. The more uh, immediate set of questions I think are gonna surround the first piece of legislation, which I understand we will be hearing more about from uh, the president-elect tonight. Um, I, I would go back to saying the first piece of this, I think, is to make sure that in whatever is done over the next few months, we don't repeat the same mistakes of the past of assuming that you can be kind of one and done, that you put something in place and that's all you need based on the current set of projections. It almost inevitably turns out that those projections are wrong. And so it's worth building in into that initial package, the type of automatic stabilizers that we talked about, even if it appears like it costs you something because um, it may reduce the spending that you're, you're otherwise doing, it is worth it to fix that structure. And I think there's an argument that could be made uh, persuasively on that point. Thank you very much, Peter. I think that's a great note to end on. Happens to be one I'm in favor of, but more importantly, it's a, it's a practical, clear implication of the argument the three of you have made. 
Um, I am very grateful to Peter Orzag, Robert Rubin, and Joseph Stiglitz, the uh, odd troika, um, who have come together in an uh, example of constructive dialogue, as they themselves have put it, um, and advanced further our rethinking of macroeconomic policy. I'm very proud that the Peterson Institute is the forum for much of the cutting edge discussion on where practical macro policy meets objective analysis or at least unbiased analysis. Um, and I'm thankful to the many people who've joined us today, as well as my many colleagues who commented on and helped to get out the policy brief. I recommend to everyone to read the actual policy brief available on the PIE website for free distribution. The video, the presentations, of our distinguished speakers today will also be on the Peterson Institute website for free distribution. And thank you all very much. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.